Today we'll be continuing with the topic we started last time, which is applied anthropology. Um, what do anthropologists know and how can they help solve some of the world's contemporary problems, both social and environmental? And so today we'll be continuing with that, but specifically focusing on environmental anthropology. What is it and how can anthropologists help solve environmental problems? Environmental anthropology is a sub-discipline of cultural anthropology, and it blends the natural sciences with the social sciences. So it links cultural anthropology with ecology. Humans are part of the total ecological system. It is a total socio-ecological system, and it should be studied that way. Um, you can't study ecology without including humans as a component of it. Um, especially today, we're having a massive impact on the environments around us. And so it looks at both the environment and humans and the mutual interaction between the two. And it doesn't focus just on contemporary interaction, but addresses both past and present human environment interactions throughout space and time. So how have humans adapted to their environments uh, throughout space and time? Sort of the materialist approach, right? Um, how did the Kung adapt via hunting and gathering to the Kalahari environment? But also, not only how do humans adapt to their environment, how do they simultaneously mutually influence and shape their environments? Um, right, it's a it's cyclical and ongoing. And there's various approaches in environmental anthropology, and I'll touch on a few just to give you a flavor of what this field is all about. Um, and so these include political ecology, historical ecology, and also human ecology. And so I'll start from the bottom up. Uh, historical ecology, or excuse me, human ecology emerges um, sort of in the 70s, um, early 70s, in reaction to the way ecology was being done at the time. Environmentalists, ecologists, biologists were studying the environment without attention to the social systems that inhabit those environments. Um, that's a key component influencing the environment. And so you're not really studying the ecology if you're not studying all components, including the human component. Human ecology then emerges um, to correct for this and says you have to also include humans as a component of the total ecological system if you want to understand what's going on in the environment um, and how humans are influencing it. Historical ecology looks at sort of the long-term human environment interaction um, in different societies throughout space and time. And so the goal is to try to gain an understanding of the cumulative effects of human environment interaction over time. Like for example, up to 20% of the Amazon rainforest is, is now considered anthropogenic, meaning human created. Um, just briefly, small scale societies that lived in Amazonia in the past, pre-Columbian, pre-colonial times, they modified the Amazon on a large scale through planting specific species that were useful to them for food. Um, they also altered the soil to make it more, more fertile for growing food. Um, but it doesn't look like what we typically think of in the Western world as human modified. It's the Amazon rainforest. It doesn't get more pristine and natural than that. However, historical ecology shows us that these natural environments are indeed partially also anthropogenic. There's a long history of humans interacting in their environments, right? In Africa, in South America, in all these various places. Humans have been part of their environments for over 2 million years, really. Um, anatomically modern Homo sapiens evolving roughly 100,000 years ago, but really not that much different than their ancestors 2 million years before that. Um, and so historical ecology seeks to understand this interaction over time. Um, and then there's political ecology. And so this adds yet a further component to studying socio-ecological systems. It still looks at how humans interact with their environment and are influenced by them, but it adds a political component and says, how is this human environment interaction often influenced in an unequal way? Um, by power dynamics, by the structure of the system. And so the case study we just read from Hartman and Boyce, that's sort of a political ecology approach. Hartman and Boyce are looking at this village Katni in Bangladesh where there's hunger, famine, poverty, and yet there's food surpluses in the country. And so you can explain this via political ecology. Um, humans 
are interacting with their environment unequally because of differential power. Some have land and others don't, which means some are able to grow food, some have economic security, and others don't. So how do politics power differences between individuals and groups that create differential access to resources? How does this add a further component to how humans interact with their various environments? So that's a little bit about environmental anthropology. Who cares? How can environmental anthropology have applications for helping to address and solve contemporary human environmental problems um, and make our beliefs and practices more sustainable so that the very life support system that supports us, the earth, the planet, doesn't become so degraded that it can no longer provide for us? And so there's sort of three main veins I want to highlight for you uh, in terms of the applications environmental ANTH has for addressing our environmental problems. The first is the role that ideology, um, worldview, how people understand the world, their belief system. How does ideology shape human environment interaction? How does it drive behavior, which in turn has implications for how sustainable that interaction is? Uh, the second vein that we'll explore is related to this notion of ideology, um, understanding how we understand problems or concepts. And so the second thing we'll talk about is called the individualization of responsibility. It's this default frame, the default, the go-to explanation for how to solve our environmental problems, which always focuses on the individual. Um, which I would also add is not the majority of the problem. Um, we'll get to this when we get to this, but how does the framing of the problem shape the solutions we come up to, up with? And if the, the, we're not understanding the problem correctly, then what good are the solutions anyways? And then the sort of third thing I wanna highlight is how we can look at other types of societies, uh, small and large scale, but mostly small scale and indigenous societies as examples. How have other societies interacted with their environment, managed their resources? How sustainable have they been or not from different places and time periods? And what can we learn from these societies to inform our own future directions for sustainability? OK, so with these three things in mind, we'll start first with the role of ideology in shaping environmental outcomes. Um, so how does culture, and especially ideology, worldview, belief systems, how people understand the world around them, their place in it, how things work, how does ideology influence patterns of behavior and thus interaction with the environment? This has implications for how sustainable resource and environmental interaction is. Sort of this idea, for example, of is nature something to conquer, to extract from, it belongs to us, or is it something to conserve, to tread lightly on? We're all part of it. Um, these are two sort of different examples of ideology, how people view nature and the environment. Um, the conquered sort of nature is something to conquer. It belongs to us. This has roots in Christianity. Not all Christian sects. Um, the exact opposite belief also exists in Christianity. Um, but sort of that God gave man dominion over the earth, right? It belongs to us. It's here for us. People truly have this ideology, this belief, and that translates into how, to how they're going to treat things, how they're going to treat resources in the environment. If it's here for us, why not just exploit the shit out of it, right? Um, also in Christianity, we're not going to be here that long anyways, right? This this life is fleeting. It's the afterlife that's that's you know long lasting. Um, the opposite side of the spectrum, nature or the environment is something to conserve. This is in line sort of with environmental movements, um, Earth Day, also kind of falls on, in line with the way small scale indigenous societies tend to sort of treat their environments. Although uh, not necessarily intentional conservation as small scale societies tend to be overall more sustainable in how they treat their environment. Um, for example, this sort of God gave us the earth, it's ours to conquer. This is Ann Coulter, um, a very, very prominent um, opinion host. She's a, she has a Fox Entertainment Network show. And Ann Coulter, this is one of the more um, gentle quotes out of her mouth. God gave us the earth. We have dominion over the plants, the animals, the trees. God said, earth is yours. Take it, rape it, 
it's yours and culture. So that's one example of how ideology can drive behavior and in turn drive how sustainable or not we are. <clears throat> this idea of looking at how worldview, culture, ideology drives behavior, how what we think drives how we act, this falls under the interpretive approach that we spoke about way back in the beginning of the semester. These two main approaches for understanding what leads cultures to be similar and or different. Um, the materialist approach, which sort of holds that the, the main most important driving force in shaping cultures is how humans meet their basic needs in their environment. And therefore, the culture, the society will be shaped through adaptation to the environment, materialist approach. The interpretive approach is sort of the opposite, and they're not mutually exclusive, meaning just because one sort of works doesn't mean the other one is false. Um, it depends on what we're looking at. And so in the interpretive approach, this says it's, it's not environment that's key. It's not the material forces. The most important thing is how people think, what's in their heads, what's their ideology, their values, their belief system. This in turn will drive behavior and how people organize around the environment um, and in turn whether or not that's sustainable. And so the key point is that from the interpretive approach, again, um, which holds that ideology, what we think will drive how we behave, it is these distinct worldviews about nature to conquer or to conserve. These distinct worldviews that generate different rationalities to what our environmental problems and solutions should be, and hence they come up with different solutions to our environmental problems. Um, remember in the beginning of class, we talked about the movie The Matrix. Keanu Reeves plays the main character, Neo, and he's walking around what he thinks is New York. He goes to work, goes to the store, blah, blah. Um, but all of that's actually not real. That's His reality is being shaped by The Matrix, this simulated reality where he thinks he's walking around living his life. He's actually lying most in, motionless in this pod, um, having his body energy and heat harvested uh, as an energy source by these machines. And they created the matrix, this simulation, to keep the human captives lying in these pods docile, to keep them subjugated, calm. Um, and so in the movie, you know, Neo gets rescued. He realizes his reality is not real. It's actually the, being shaped by the matrix and uh, blah, blah, blah. See the movie if you want. But the matrix, remember, it's a metaphor for culture in the same way that Neo's reality, what he thought was real, what he perceived around him, wasn't in fact objective reality, but rather, uh, excuse me, but rather it was shaped by the matrix, the simulation. And in the same way, matrix as a metaphor for culture, the way you perceive the world around you, the way you understand things, your ideology, your worldview, your perception of the world is also shaped not by the matrix, but by our culture, by the culture in which we are brought up in, right? The pill you take, the culture you swallow is gonna influence how you see the world. And it, so from the interpretist point of view, these differing ideas about nature to conquer or to conserve are what makes sustainability so problematic. People don't agree. Thoughtful people have different and mutually irreconcilable ideas of just what is sustainable and what is not. And therefore they come up with different solutions or non-solutions to our problems because they have different understandings of what faces us. Uh, let's look at a couple of different examples of very different worldviews about nature. And again, worldview is influenced by culture in addition to upbringing, family, values, and other things. Um, and so examples. Uh, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, the acronym pronounced the um, And we'll also look at an example from Rush Limbaugh. So first, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. And I'm just going to read from what their website says. Vehement, pr pronounced vehement, 
is a movement, not an organization. It's a movement advanced by people who care about life on planet Earth. We're not just a bunch of misanthropes and antisocial Malthusian misfits taking morbid delight whenever disaster strikes humans. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Voluntary human extinction is the humanitarian alternative to human disasters. We don't carry on about how the human race has shown itself to be a greedy, amoral parasite on the once healthy face of this planet. That type of negativity offers no solution to the inexorable horrors which human activity is causing. Rather, the movement presents an encouraging alternative to the callous exploitation and wholesale destruction of Earth's ecology. As vehement volunteers know, the hopeful alternative to the extinction of millions of species of plants and animals is the voluntary extinction of one species, Homo sapiens, us. Each time another one of us decides to not add another one of us to the burgeoning billions already squatting on this ravaged planet, another ray of hope shines through the gloom. When every human chooses to stop breeding, Earth's biosphere will be allowed to return to its former glory. All remaining creatures will be free to live, die, evolve if they believe in evolution and will perhaps pass away as so many of nature's experiments have done throughout the eons. It's going to take all of us going. Okay, so on the one hand, vehement uh, sees the problems to our environment caused by human activity is so detrimental that the only solution is for us to voluntarily stop reproducing and go extinct so that we no longer have an impact and stop destroying the planet. That's one view on one side of the spectrum. Uh, sort of another example from the other side of the spectrum, um, and this comes from Rush Limbaugh. Um, it says Professor Limbaugh, but he doesn't have a degree or any credentials. He's a he's a talk show host. Um, and so what I want you to do is go ahead and pause the lecture and watch this clip. It's only a minute. It's audio only. And then come back to lecture. OK, so hopefully you watched the clip. Um, and so Rush Limbaugh, who, by the way, he is a conservative um, talk show radio host, a uh, conservative Republican. Um, he actually recently was just awarded like the Medal of Freedom um, at the, the United States, um, excuse me, the State of the Union address that the president recently gave. Um, for, for reasons kind of unknown, he's actually been known to spread a lot of misinformation and really extremely racist uh, some disgusting rhetoric. So um, anyways, that's kind of who Rush Limbaugh is. And it's it's important. It's, I'm not pointing it out to villainize him, but it's important to know where these people come from because ideas don't exist in a vacuum, right? They come from people and people may or may not be informed of what they're talking about. They may have alternative objectives. Um, it may not actually be about health or what's best for people. Um, it might be about someone's agenda or own values, which may be um, based on misinformation. And so anyways, Rush Limbaugh says that, oh my God, to even think about the fact global warming is a fucking hoax. And this is what he says, not me. It's not a hoax. It's happening. Um, and to even think about uh, that there's an environmental problem is absolutely stupid. And because there's no problem, we do not need to take any actions towards the environment or solving environmental problems or becoming more sustainable. It's stupid because we don't actually have a problem. CO2 can't be bad for the environment. It's part of how we breathe. We exhale it. Rush Limbaugh. Um, and just to be clear, scientists are not interested in the role of CO2 um, directly on human health right? Because yeah, we do exhale it. Uh, they are interested in the role CO2 plays in warming up the global atmosphere, which is in turn causing rapid climate change. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, meaning relative to other molecules in the atmosphere, it absorbs and re-radiates more solar radiation than other molecules. And so essentially greenhouse gases like CO2 or methane, they trap more heat in the atmosphere relative to other atmospheric molecules. The more greenhouse gases we pump into the atmosphere, the more heat we trap, which in turn is driving climate change. Um, much of climate change centers around temperature gradients. That's what weather really is. And so if you change the temperature gradient just a little bit via global warming, um, this will cause climate change manifest in more extreme weather, which is exactly what we're seeing. Um, so just to clarify that.
And so on the one hand, you have the voluntary human extinction movement. It sees human activity as so detrimental to our resource base that we literally need to go extinct. Um, on the other hand, you have Rush Limbaugh. And we don't have environmental problems. We exhale CO2. And so anyone that thinks so, that we have an issue, you're, you're stupid. The point, again, is not to villainize either side, um, it, which it can be hard not to, right? But sustainability is problematic, not because there are all sorts of villains and ignoramuses out there. There are some, um, but it's not because there's just a bunch of villains hell-bent on unsustainability. It is because people, virtuous and thoughtful people, educated or not, have different and mutually irreconcilable ideas of just what is sustainable and what is not. It is these contradictory worldviews on climate change and sustainability um, that underlie the different positions, right? Why people don't agree and why it's difficult to move forward. The way we frame the problem is going to influence how we propose to solve it, right? As you see with Vehement and Rush Limbaugh. Okay, so on a related note, the second thing I want to highlight for you um, is this notion of how we talk about and frame a problem or an issue is going to shape how we understand it and in turn shape the solutions that we come up with. If you're not understanding the problem correctly uh, and you're not asking the right questions, then the solutions you come up with are going to be flawed. They're not going to be solutions. Um, and so this comes, these clips come from a San Francisco newspaper from 2014. Um, Governor Brown called on individuals at this time to reduce their water usage by 20%, excuse the typo, uh, because we are in an extreme drought at the time, the most extreme ever recorded. And I'm telling you right now that it will not be the last. We will be right back where we are because we don't really have much water in California. Most of it comes from the Colorado River, 50% to be exact. And so from the article, uh, Brown committed to using his executive powers to steer water where it's most needed. He directed state agencies to immediately scale back water consumption. Perhaps more importantly, the governor called on Californians to voluntarily reduce their water use by 20 percent. One of the most important things that you have to have happen is that people need to use less water. Okay, so notice that they briefly mentioned state agencies and larger, larger organizations, but the main focus where the most important impact is going to be is individuals. One of the most important things you can have happen. Individual actions do matter. Turning off the tap, recycling, taking shorter showers, get rid of your lawn. It adds up. It does matter. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. It does. But how much water do individuals actually use in the state of California? And think about it. All drought reduction, all conservation strategies are essentially focused on you, on individuals. You should use less, reuse, get rid of this, do that. You, you, you. How can you help? Individual actions matter, but who actually uses most of the water? Most of the water is not used by individuals or households. If you look at the figure, 80%, over 80% of the water in the entire state of California goes to agriculture, to farming. On top of that, farmers only pay about 17% of the cost of that water because it's heavily subsidized by the government, meaning we use tax dollars to pay for the water that the farmers use to make their costs of production cheaper. And it's not the small farm, farmer benefiting, it's large scale farms and corporations that are getting the subsidies. Don't worry too much about that, but I just wanna mention it um, because keep in mind, 80% of the water is going to agriculture. It's subsidized, meaning the people using it aren't really paying for it. And if you're not really paying for it and you're getting money based off how much you use, which is how they identify need, there is no incentive to conserve it. And in fact, these large farms will lose the subsidy if they don't use all of the water because it's based off use, which is identifiable need. So even if they don't need all the water, the incentive is to still use it all so they get that subsidy next year, that tax money back. 
80% of the water goes to agriculture. You can take all the fucking shorter showers you want. It will not solve the water crisis in California. 20%, that tiny red slice of the pie, that's household and individual use and all other urban uses, including residential, commercial, institutional, and industrial using. That red slice of the pie is everything but agriculture. And so great, focus on individuals, take shorter showers. That's not the majority of the problem. And therefore that will not be the solution. These structural organizational factors are far more important in terms of sustainability. And by structural factors, I mean the way the economic and social system is set up, the policies surrounding water use and prices. These structural factors are so much more important in terms of environmental impact. Um, and again, most of that water, 80%, most of it's subsidized. The, the farm, farmers, these large farmers aren't actually even paying for it. And so this consistent focus on the individual, you should use less, you should do this to solve our problems. This is called the default framing for sustainability. It's the individualization of responsibility for environmental problems. It's the default, it's the go-to. We automatically, without even thinking about it, oh, we're in a drought, what, we should do, what should we do? Use less, shorter showers, get rid of your lawn. Default, go-to, we don't even have to think about it. We know the solution. You need to use less. This is the default frame. And it's a major barrier to sustainability. It, it disproportionately emphasizes individuals, even though that's a small part of the problem of the impact. It, the focus on the individual makes it seem like the problem is ours and ours only to solve. And most importantly, by consistently focusing on individuals, it glosses over and ignores the larger issues and causes underlying problems in sustainability with water or whatever in California. Okay. Individual actions still matter, but they are a smaller part of the problem than you may have been led to believe. Um, and the consistent focus on individuals ignores the larger organizational problems. The fact that 80% of the water goes to agriculture. Who do you think is going to waste more water? Individuals or organizations? And the picture on the left, that's irrigation in Central Valley, where most of the water subsidies that are that go to large farms uh, go. Not a responsible use of water. Think about how much evaporation is allowed to occur. Um, but again, there's no incentive to conserve it. Um, the policies are backwards. The incentives are backwards. They're getting paid for wasting it, essentially. Okay, so individualization of responsibility, the default frame, this is a major barrier to sustainability. Um, and it's not just water, it's all things environmental. We're always focusing on what individual consumers can do. They are a small proportion of the, of the issue compared to corporations and these larger organizational and structural barriers. So we've been sort of discussing, uh, I've been trying to make a case for how environmental anthropology can help us understand and therefore solve environmental problems. But I haven't really made a case yet that the environment needs saving, that we're facing problems. And so we will turn to that now. Uh, what is the current state of our life support system, the earth, uh, the planet, which we depend on for survival? And the relatively recent human environment interaction in the context of industrial and post-industrial society, our culture, has had major impacts on the environment. It's led to a lot of degradation and overall data would suggest it doesn't appear to be sustainable in the long run. Um, there's a lot of evidence for this and we'll look at a few strands of it to highlight what I mean. Um, and keep, keep in mind as we talk, why are humans destroying our life support system? Why? Humans have been around at least 100,000 years, anatomically, modernly speaking, and really 2 million years. We weren't that much different from our ancestors 2 million years ago. And yet this massive degradation of the environment has really only begun in the last hundred years, last couple hundred years since the Industrial Revolution, and especially just the last 50 years out of 2 million years of human existence. Why now? What's going on? And it's not human nature that causes environmental degradation. It's not an inevitable result of human societies. It is a result of the specific cultures and socio 
cultural organizations that we have developed. Welcome to the Anthropocene. This is the cover of The Economist in 2011. Um, and the Anthropocene, for those of you that haven't heard of it, is a term, a, a new term being used to describe what has been called a new geological epoch that we've entered. Um, and the Anthropocene means the age of humans. And so the point of the Anthropocene is that humans are having such an impact on our environment, on the earth, that we've actually ushered in a new geological epoch. Uh, the Anthropocene, meaning the age of humans. And so it's this new term to describe the current epoch in which we're in. Um, this is significant. Geological epochs are defined by observed changes in lithology, chemical composition, or some other event recognized worldwide in the Earth's strata and sediments um, that archaeologists and geologists and other scientists can, can study these strata to study the Earth's history. Um, so, for example, on the slide that shows in the stratigraphy, the famous transition between the Cretaceous period and the Paleocene epoch. Um, it's also called the CT boundary. This is the end of the dinosaurs. This is the end of the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct. And it leaves a mark in the Earth's sediments that can be recognized, again, um, worldwide. And so this event was probably caused by the impact of a huge meteor, um, probably in the Gulf of Mexico. That in turn triggered global tsunamis, wildfires, and basically a start of a nuclear winter um, where much of the sunlight was blotted out and that in turn killed off the vegetation. The dying, the dying of the vegetation in turn killed off the herbivorous dinosaurs that fed off those plants and in turn the carnivores that ate those herbivores also went extinct. Um, and so this mass, this massive extinction is defined by the extinction of the dinosaurs and lots of other animals on the land and the sea. Um, and so it's sort of disconcerting that stratigraphers have come to believe we are such an event that humans have so altered the planet in just the past century or so, we've ushered in a new epoch, the Anthropocene. Um, it's these major events like the extinction of the dinosaurs that that breaks the planet's history into these comprehensible chapters. And again, it's kind of scary that humans and human activity may be such an event. And we're currently in the most extreme extinction crisis since the dinosaur extinction. Um, and it seems to be is anthropogenic, meaning human caused. Uh, we'll get to that here shortly. And so humans uh, plus our technology is becoming a geological force in its own right. Um, our mark is going to endure in the geological record long after our cities have crumbled and long after we're gone. We are modifying the earth to such an extent that our impact is going to be visible in the geology of the planet far into the future. So evidence that these changes are indeed anthropogenic. Um, People argue that there's always been natural fluctuations in environment and climate, and that's absolutely true um, related to different glacial cycles, polar reversals, um, and other factors. However, the scale of these fluctuations has increased exponentially in a very short, rapid time period. And so what evidence is there that these massive changes occurring to the Earth are indeed a result of anthropogenic meaning human activities. What types of planetary changes characterize the Anthropocene, the age of humans? Um, and so in just the last really few hundred years, there's been many drastic changes, um, unprecedented really in our history. Um, first on the top, the graph shows massive increases in species extinction rates. Um, especially just in the last 100 to 50 years. The, the chart looks from 1750 to 2000, 1750 being the start of the Industrial Revolution, <clears throat> which has allowed for global market economies and globalization and global capitalism. Um, and look at that, look at that exponential rate. And that's not extinctions in absolute numbers, that's in the thousands. So we're talking um, 50,000 species going extinct per year in recent decades. 
Um, on the slide, that's a picture of the dodo, which is sort of an archetype of extinct animals because it's the first animal that has gone, went extinct. Um, the, well, its extinction occurred during recorded human history and it was directly attributable to human activities. So the dodo was a flightless bird. Flightless birds don't do well when invasive species are typically introduced. Um, a flightless bird in the Indian Ocean, islands in the Indian Ocean, uh, related to pigeons and doves, about three feet tall, uh, 44 pounds, ate fruit and nested on the ground, again, flightless. And so the dodo's been extinct since the mid to late 17th century, um, again, because of human activity. Um, one of the main causes is we've been increasingly converting Earth's landscapes to human purposes, especially agricultural land. And the result is habitat loss for lots and lots of species. So that's one major cause behind species extinction rates, um, among numerable causes like pollution, increasing toxicity, acidification of our oceans, bleaching of our coral reefs. All these ecosystems, as we damage them, uh, decrease habitats for uh, species and biodiversity. So we're seeing exponential increases in extinction. The second middle graph that shows northern hemisphere surface temperature anomalies. And so it's from 1000 to 2000. Um, and what you're seeing is temperature anomalies, like it being colder than it's supposed to be at a given time or hotter than it's supposed to be at a given time. Temperature anomalies are increasing um, quite a bit. Um, and so temperature gradients have been increasing. <clears throat> surface temp has always fluctuated but there's been the anomalies have exponentially increased in just the last few hundred years really the last 50 to 100 and this increase in surface temperature anomalies it's related to the industrial revolution um look, look at this time period right 1750 and that's right about when the anomalies start to go up in 1750 down here um, it's no mistake that as temperature anomalies go up, um, atmospheric CO2 concentration has also gone up. Um, this is probably what's driving changes in temperature. As we release more CO2 into the atmosphere, the main cause being fossil fuel burning, uh, the overall climate warms up a bit. Um, it increases the temperature by a few degrees. The result of this is not an overall warmer climate. And this is why scientists have stopped calling it global warming. They call it climate change now because climate change deniers like President Trump jump on global warming and say, but it's snowing. So global warming's false. That's not what global warming is. And that's why you, typically you hear people call it climate change now. So, so we can't, people can't use this red herring of, but it's snowing. Um, that's just, that's stupid. What climate change actually is, what weather basically is, is different temperature gradients interacting. Um, so if you have different, different temperatures in different air masses, those air masses also have different densities, right? Um, and so as they move, you have dense air moves into less dense air. This creates weather. If you change the overall temperature of the climate by a couple of degrees, what you do is increase temperature gradients. And the result, therefore, of climate change is more temperature anomalies and more extreme weather um, as these cold and hot air masses clash more violently because the temperature gradients have been increased. That's what climate change is all about. And we're already seeing it happening. Um, and so it's not about things it becoming summer everywhere. That's not what it's about. And if you hear people talking like that, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and so you see this massive increase in CO2 emissions also after the Industrial Revolution. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It traps more heat relative to other atmospheric molecules. Um, again, meaning it traps more heat. It warms up. It increases those temperature gradients, causes increasing climate change. And even if we stopped emitting CO2 today, just stopped, the atmosphere would still continue to change in terms of temperature because of how much CO2 we've already emitted into the atmosphere. Um, another example of human activity causing changes, driving climate change and changes to our resource base. This is an example of decreasing species diversity and just dwindling 
species populations in general. Uh, McClinican in 2009 published in Conservation Biology, very prestigious journal, uh, documenting the loss of large trophy fish from the Florida Keys with historical photographs. And so it shows this concrete example of changes to our resource base. And what they did is they measured um, trends for several different groups of recreational caught fish. So in Key West, Florida, there's these two charter boats that have been operating since the 50s, and they're still operating today, basically in the same way. So people come, pay money, they go out on these boats, they go fishing, um, and that, that's what they do. And so this is 1957. This is landings from uh, the, two, the two boats. <clears throat> in 1957. Check out the size of the fish. Those are huge. They're as big as the people. Um, and there's even some sharks there um, sort of on the bottom you can see down here. Look at that. Keep in mind the scale of the size of these fish um, compared to the people. And so McClinican looked at photos, historical photos from 1957, also historical photos from 1983. Again, the same two boats operating in the same place in Key West, landing fish on the same docks. Uh, 57 took pictures in 83 and then came in 2007 and took uh, his own set of photographs of the fish landings in 2007. So good sized fish, um, large predatory species, a lot of reproductively mature adults being caught. This is a signal of a healthy fish population, a healthy ecosystem. A um, couple of big couple of things, large predatory species. That's a good sign. It means you have um, enough other species in the ecosystem supporting those large apex predators. Um, it means you have a, it, a healthy ecosystem. And another thing is, it also means you have reproductively mature adults in the population, which means the population can continue to breed and reproduce itself. Um, once, if you start getting all small fish and not pulling adults out anymore, um, that's a problem. That means it you might have already overfished that population to the point where it can't really successfully reproduce itself. You've pulled out all the reproducing adults. It's just young ones. They might make it. They might not. So 1957 looks good. This is 1983. Same two boats operating in the same way, landing in the same place. Um, and these are the fish landings in 1983. Still not bad, still a pretty good sized fish. Um, it's a little bit of shark right here, but not as big as the other ones. This is 1983, the first ones were 1957. And this is the photos he took in 2007. Same two boats operating in the same way, landing in the same place. Trophy fish. I mean, the mean average size declined from something like 20 kilograms to 2.3 kilograms. Um, the point is our, our resource base, uh, fish populations, other resources, they're dwindling. Um, and fisheries specifically, so many have been caught, it's all just young ones. The population is crashing. And it's not just Key West. Uh, fisheries experts estimate anywhere from 90 to 99 percent of our fish stocks around the world are already over or fully exploited, meaning um, they're probably not coming back. Other evidence that humans are driving environmental and climate changes. Um, this shows atmospheric CO2 concentration back past the historical record all the way back until 400,000 years before present. CO2 levels, as with other atmospheric gases, have always fluctuated up and down. But for the past 400,000 years, they've always remained below 300 parts per million. Parts per million is simply a measure of the volume concentration of the gas in the atmosphere. Don't worry about it. Um, always below 300. From the Industrial Revolution um, into 1950, so in just 200 years, we, for the first time in 400,000 years, went above 300 parts per million. Um, we were up to 310 by 1950. From 1950 to now, uh, or 2000 roughly, we went from 310 to 380. Um, most of the increase in this has been just in the last 30 years. And just a few years ago, we for the first time ever passed the 400 parts per million mark. And we're probably never coming back down below that. Um, as we continue to emit CO2, we, the atmosphere will continue to trap more heat. 
This will continue to change temperature gradients, driving climate change, extreme weather, rising sea levels, and all the other things we're starting to see. How do they measure this? How, do, how the hell do you know what atmospheric gas concentration was 400,000 years ago? They have some cool ways for doing this. One is ice cores. Um, this data set comes from the Vostek site in Antarctica, and they take these long cylindrical hollow drills, drill them down into the ice and underlying bedrock, and pull out these ice cores. Trapped in the ice cores are gas bubbles uh, and you can then measure what types of molecules are trapped and use that as a proxy for atmospheric gas concentration during that time period. It's allowed us to extend our data record way back to about again 400,000 years before present. And there's several other lines of evidence to illustrate humans are indeed uh, changing and many would argue degrading the earth our life support system and so because of this people that do development work um remember we talked about development last time trying to boost the economy uh, or social well-being of other countries to improve livelihoods and so economic growth and development is now needs to be done with a mind towards the environment and sustainability as well um, so sustainable development is now defined as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the needs of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, so the idea being you don't want to destroy the very resource base that the economy and that we depend on. Um, act sustainably so that the resources can continue to sustain us in the future, right? Uh, one thing to point out, is anyone notice something really vague or kind of ambiguous about this definition? What, and what I'm, what I'm thinking of is what are our needs? Um, how, how are, how is that defined? And, and are our needs always expanding? Do we need water? Yeah, food probably, um, sex, but what about an iPhone or a new shirt? Or, right in many cases our needs go so far beyond human necessity and so this is one really vague point in this definition is sustainability just about the earth um, earth for earth's sake uh, do we need to save the earth does the earth need us to save it who are we actually saving the earth for Are environmental problems really about the environment? And so what we're gonna do now is watch a brief clip by comedian, late comedian, George Carlin. For those of you that don't know him, he's hilarious. Um, and so we're gonna watch this clip. The planet is fine. Um, go ahead and pause the lecture watch it. Um, it's stand-up comedy. It's about seven to eight minutes, and it's funny, but there's a reason that we're watching it. Okay, so hopefully you watch the, you, I know you just watched the George Carlin clip. Um, what is the what is Earth Day? What are environmental movements really all about? Is it for the Earth? Yeah, maybe, but also it's for us. Um, the Earth has a finite carrying capacity. It can only absorb so much CO2 and other toxins and pollutants um, before this starts to have consequences. And the environmental consequences of this are already apparent in the acidification of our oceans. As more and more CO2 enters the ocean because of the fossil fuels we're burning, it makes the water more acidic. This kills coral reef systems. It kills marine life. Um, shelled organisms aren't able to build their shells because calcium carbonate ions and the ocean have been dissolved by the acid, the CO2 that reacts with it. Um, we see exponential extinction rates, global warming, climate change, um, increased natural disasters, rising sea levels, drought. Actually, a study it, at UNR a few years ago linked seismic activity, earthquakes in the Sierra Nevadas to irrigation withdrawal in the Central Valley of California. And so much of this 
these changes, they're not a result of natural fluctuations. They are a direct result of human activity and impact. But as George Carlin says, despite this, the planet is fine. The planet's doing fine. It's been through polar reversals and magnetic this and volcanoes and blah, blah. You want to know how the planet's doing? Ask those people in Pompeii that are frozen in volcanic ash if they feel like a threat to the planet today, right? The planet's going to be fine. It's always undergone massive exchange. It was here after the dinosaurs went extinct. The planet's going to be fine. It's the people that are fucked. We are destroying the earth, the resources, air, water that our very survival depends on. Planet's going to be here long into the future. Um, the question is, will we? And we may not if we continue to degrade the very life support system the planet that makes our life possible. And so while the environmental movement and sustainability might be for Earth's sake, yeah, maybe Earth's sake because we like nature, we value the environment for its own sake, we respect it, we enjoy it. And I think a lot of that's true. Um, but it's sustainability also for humans' sake, um, definitely. Because we're, I mean, many would argue we've approached some limits in terms of the environment. We're running up against environmental barriers in terms of the way we're doing things. Technology might be able to help mitigate this for a while, but not forever if we don't change the way we're doing things. And so becoming more sustainable isn't so much about the earth for earth's sake. You can feel that way, but really when you get down to it, it's also for humans, right? Um, so that we can still be here. 